Now, we um, touched a little bit on the issue of fraud in our first session yesterday with the C-suite, and uh, they talked about how it is a big and growing issue for banks and for payment providers. Cisco uh, is a world leader in cybercrime detection, so to tell you a little bit more about what you need to be aware of is Cisco's New Zealand country manager, Dave Wilson. March 20th, 1950, New York. New York was suffering a serious security crisis. People were worried about their money. Now, you may ask me what the significance of this date is. This is the date, the first time the FBI released their 10 top most wanted fugitives list. And on the top of that list was this guy, Willie Sutton. Anybody know Willie? If you don't know Willie, he was the most and still is the most notorious bank robber in US history. Willie used to run with the likes of Al Capone and the gangsters of the time. He made a 30-year career out of robbing banks. He escaped prison three times, three times. And during this, he mastered and leveraged the art of disguise, often and regularly. Now, Willie ended up with a lot of nicknames, as you can imagine. Willie the actor, Slick Willie. Uh, Willie often used these disguises in escaping from prison. Willie disguised as a prison guard. Uh, in bank robberies, Willie often disguised himself as a police officer, a window washer, and actually even a diplomat. Willie made $2 million during his 30-year career. $2 million. Think about it. That's a lot of money back then. And these days, someone was telling me that's about $20 million US, right? But everything has to come to an end. And they finally caught up with Willie. And as they caught up with Willie, and they took him away in handcuffs and dragged him away, someone came up to Willie and said, why do you keep going back? Why do you keep robbing banks? And he said something quite profound. Because that's where the money is. Right? Simple, right? Think about it. To be a bank robber in those days was very, very lucrative especially if you had mastered the art of disguise. But fast forward to today. It's a very, very different criminal landscape. A new, more aggressive criminal has emerged. They don't just operate locally, they operate globally. They don't solely focus on banks anymore. They focus on all industries and all verticals, including government. They focus on hospitals. They target toy manufacturers, car manufacturers. Now, they have become a lot more aggressive in what they do. They don't need guns, they don't need getaway cars, they don't need disguises. What they do and what they leverage is new digital tools, such as ransomware. So, think about it. What does this new age criminal look like? We all saw what Willie looked like there before. So think about it now. So, to put it into context, recently a cyber gang was recently caught netting in a very short space of time 40 million New Zealand dollars. Now, they did court, which is a miracle because a lot of the times we're not catching them at the moment. 40 million, think of that, that's a lot more than Willie earned in 30 years and they did this in less than six months. But the miracle was these guys are caught because they weren't usually. They were caught in a beach in Thailand and have arrested and are being held there in custody for extradition to the US to stand trial. Now, stop for a second and think about what you think this person might look like. Just for a second. Well, I bet this isn't what you were thinking about. This is Olga. Olga was the lead and member of this gang of cyber criminals. This is her just before she got caught in Thailand on the beach. So what was Olga after? Well, Olga was after the data. Willie was after the banks because that's where the money is. The money is no longer in the banks now. The money is in the data. That's what they're chasing. And there's more and more data than there ever has been before. And think about the data. We loosely throw that around. But what is inside that data? What does that value hold for you on that data? If someone locked that data up, if someone stole that data, if someone threatened to expose that data to your customers, what would that be worth? What would you be prepared to pay for that, to get that back, to stop that being released publicly? To make it even worse, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for these guys that are hunting the data is growing 
extensively. In fact, 90% of the world's data has been created just in the last two years alone. Two years. In fact, every day, 2.5 quintillion, and I still got it wrong. I'm practicing it all day. I don't even know how big that is, but it's a lot of data, right? And that just means there's more and more for them to find, to get. Now, our legacy systems of trying to protect this and look after this data and keep this data, and you know, what is in this data? IP, you know, it's, it's our customer database. It may be our competitive edge. It may be sensitive information that at the moment regulation isn't making us publish. And how do we protect it? It's getting harder and harder. It was harder before it even started growing this fast. To make it worse, experts like Gartner tell us that 25% of the corporate data, of this massive amount of data, is going to go away from the high garden walls that protect us today, that we've installed today, that our IT teams have installed. 25%. That means we're 75% safe. 75%. Would you eat in a restaurant that had a 75% rating? No, we wouldn't, right? So, is it real? Is this really real? Is all this data real? Should we be worrying? Well, we shouldn't worry, but we should be aware. And that's what I want to leave you with today, is are you going to be aware? Are you thinking about it? First of all, in the middle layer, there was a network. In 1984, the first networks were built. We built them. We built the internet. 80% of the world's data goes across our equipment. In 1984, when we started, only 1,000 devices were connected to the internet. Now, there's billions of devices connected to the internet. And this is partly the problem. Bringing in a laptop was fine, and a computer was fine. But then they be started becoming portable. Bring your own device, BYOD, iPad. You could take them in and out of your sacred walled garden. And that means they were vulnerable, and that's why it's only 25% safe. You had your data then in your data centers, but now the data centers are public, they're private, and they're hybrid. Now the cloud came along, and now our data's been pushed up into the cloud. Protecting again on our garden wall wasn't helping us. Then comes along the Internet of Things, and you probably hear this thrown around all the time. Is it real? Is it not? Well, it is real. And today, the, ex the, the estimate is that 50 billion things, 50 billion, will be connected to the Internet by the end of 2020. Now, to put this in perspective and put some real data along it, more cars were connected to the Internet last year than there were people. More cars. But it's not just cars. Light bulbs are now connected, surveillance cameras are now connected, all creating their own data. Not only all creating their own data, creating their own paths to the weak link inside your organisations. If they're connected, someone can get to them. Someone showed me something the other day where a toaster was connected and it was hacked within a minute of being connected. Hacked within a minute of being connected. But don't worry, there's a solution. There's always a solution. Buy a box, some software. That's what we've been doing for 20 years. Actually, we've got a lot of problems, so buy a lot of boxes. And you probably need some resiliency, so you know, chuck in a few more boxes. And this is an oversimplified view of what probably most of your organizations look like today over the last 20 years. In fact, this is what it really looks like. This is the complexity. So what that creates us is a new world of complexity we haven't dealt with. This is a big industry. That's why we're in it. That's why I love it. There's a lot of people in it. A lot of startups in there. 10 billion a year companies spend with those vendors. In fact, it's not uncommon for some vendors, for some partners, sorry, customers, to have over 40 vendors in their environment. 40. That's not products, that's vendors. Because they're stacking product on product, trying to make sure they're defended and they're safe. What that causes is what we call the security effectiveness gap. The more you stack, you would think your capabilities go up. That's not true, it plateaus out. In fact, what does go up is the complexity. The complexity of running it, the complexity of managing it, of integrating it, of finding the gaps between the, the boxes that you find. So the answer is, moving along, is to close that security gap. So that when we do, the capabilities do continue to go back up and the complexities come down. Another stat for you. At the moment, if they don't want to be found, because you know sometimes they don't want to be found, they want to get in and out of your network, take some stuff, they don't, they don't want you to know about it. Think about if they're trying to steal your intellectual property. We have had meetings with people that have come to us asking us to protect their data, and when we query so hard at why, it's because they've stolen someone else's intellectual property, 
added their go-to-market software and go-to-market on it have now become number two in the market and now they're worried someone's going to steal theirs. 100 days is the average. This isn't a joke, look it up. 100 days is the average time to detection for any of your organisations to find out they've been hacked. Now, that was the same for Cisco. This is why we got into security. We are a $60 billion business and we're very large and we invest a lot of money. We invest over $12 billion a year in R&D. Five billion of that in security. Now, have we been hacked? Yes. Did we have a big breach window? We did have a big breach window. Did some of our stuff get out there? We think it did. In fact, we believe that some of the Fortune 500 companies that are no longer with us today have had enough IP stolen from them and someone taken it to have lost their competitive market edge. We've now got this down to, depending on which attack you're talking to, down to 13 hours and less, sometimes in seconds. What we're doing now is passing that on to our customers and to our partners so that they too can protect themselves. Now, we've talked about Willy, we've talked about Olga. Willy was after the money, so he was robbing banks. Olga's after the money, so she's going after your data. Now, is there really a business here? What, what does it look like? Well, we all measure our markets. We know what our market share is like. We know what it takes to gain another percent of market share. Are we going to grow organically? Are we going to acquire? How are we going to do it? So we, we've got a feel for our market. Well, so do they. This year alone, the ransomware side of cyber criminal activity is going to make them $1 billion. $1 billion. Most of this is paid in Bitcoin. Most of it is not traceable. Most of them are not found. This is very lucrative, like it used to be for Willie. The whole cybercrime economy at the moment is estimated to be 500 billion. Some people say, and some of the analysts we work with, say that some countries' cybercrime is as bad as a percentage of their GDP. Think about that. We could all do with an extra percentage of GDP. So what are they doing with this money? Well, they're investing it, and they're investing it fast, and they're investing it hard. They are developing product like we've never seen before. It's not someone in a hoodie, as you've seen, hiding somewhere eating pizza. They are developing using agile DevOps methodology. They're outsourcing their code for stress testing before it they released. They even offer this code out as a service. So you don't even know, you don't even need to know how to code. You can actually buy it as a service. You can actually buy access to a customer's database or a customer's network as a service. That's what they provide. We all talk about wanting consumption models. They're offering it. R rapid release of products. Rapid release. So they, they take advantage of the time between one update and the other. And then they release and they'll attack inside that if you're too slow to upgrade. So they're spending a lot of money. They're well trained. There is today one million people short in the US of cyber engineers, cyber, cyber uh, qualified people, one million. In fact, my colleague was in China two weeks ago and they're building a university in China just for cyber security, just for cyber security. It's a massive shortage. And who can pay the best money for them straight out of uni and straight out of grads is these guys, and they are. How did you decide to become a hacker? <laughs> well, I'm not really sure what it means to become a hacker. That's like some guy in a hoodie who types really fast and stays up all night writing code and cracking passwords. It's not me. I just spy on people and see what makes them click. It's not a bad job. Mark Hanning, CEO of Qualicart, set to report earnings after their blockbuster IP. So you consider this a job? I put a lot of work into this. I'm not lazy. It takes research to figure out the key players, learn all about them, their families, their friends, what they care about. You have to understand the company's organization. I get a lot of my information from the sales department because they're always so quick and eager. They're hungry. People trust too easily. They don't look at the details. I do. Details matter. That's what I'm good at. 
It has to look completely believable. It has to look familiar. This is where research is important. It's not some generic piece of spam. It's an email from their boss with their company's signature. It's written in the voice of the boss. It's what he would say if he were writing this. What about the malware itself? How does that work? Somebody else out there already wrote all the code that does the actual attack. I'm just using it in the attachment. My skill is in my ability to get a bunch of people to click on that attachment. I always wonder what it's like when the whole thing unfolds on their end, when the panic sets in. Please leave your message after the beep. Hey, this is Rajiv in finance. Call me as soon as you get this. Something's up with my laptop. I can't Katie, are you on your way into the office? Something's going on with our file server. Uh, uh, Karen and HR, our, our benefits dashboard seems really slow. We're getting calls from users on it. Can you call me get this? Julian Coffin's down. Apparently, there's a malware attack targeting our main... It's ransomware. They're holding us hostage. We're locked out of everything. I, I can't even check my phone. What about the backup? That will take days. We need this fixed now. Just pay it. We don't have a choice. We're reporting earnings in two hours. But how do we know Just that they'll... pay it. Put every single person on getting us back up and running. That's the only priority now. Okay, it's done. I have the decrypt key. Problem. The ransomware was just to distract us. They got inside. They got everything. Customer data, financials, everything. Walla Cards is reeling today from the news that hackers have released the personal information of nearly the two Nasdaq million. The Nasdaq closed lower today, led by Walla Card, which was down 14% on news that their recent data the breach may be far worse than the company its originally stock fell to a new all-time low on news that CEO Mark Hanning is stepping down after what is turning out to be one of the worst breaches of personal information in recent history. Do you feel bad about releasing the personal information? All the financials? All the money that was lost? All I did was get the files. I'm not the one that decided to release them. I'm not the one that shorted the stock. Somebody else had their reasons for that. It's above my pay grade. I was paid to do a job, and I did it well. And that's what's expected of anyone, isn't it? Anyway, markets bounce back. Hollywood or real? It's real. We don't just block, we don't just see 80% of the world's data, we actually have teams that go in and try to find where these attacks are coming from, what they're doing, then actively make the changes to protect it. That's real. Why does the CEO always the one get fired? <laughs> but, you know, you have to think about this in, in the terms of um, how are we going to deal with this and, and, and what are next steps? So, and it's, it's not to scare, it's to make aware. I mean, think about it. The hacker used a valid looking email to deliver it to the employees. The hacker built enough trust, trust is big, built enough trust in everybody to make it look real. The malicious file was executed on the employee's laptop. And ultimately, the hacker stole, as we saw, information. Now, and shorted the stock. Did people not do enough and st still do enough now to throw cricket games, horse races, whatever? But this is a lot easier. This is stuff is real and it's happening in multiple ways. It's always, it always talks about financial data, but it's, a, it, it's true, but it's a lot of data. It's not just the financial data. In fact, on the market today, patient records are worth more than someone's financial data. And what, are, what else might that data look like? Like I said, your intellectual property. We spend billions a year on our intellectual property. Other companies do as well. So what is it that they're getting? And how could they use it? So as we said, there is an answer. And um, I won't go on to solutioning, obviously. But as we've seen, we all have a lot of different endpoints. We connect at different networks at home, at work. We have data in the cloud. We have some of our services in the cloud as a service. And so the real answer is you can't just defend and have your high garden walls anymore. You have to have an architectural approach to look after and point and guard everything from endpoint to network, talking to the cloud with threat intelligence around it. 
basically always looking, always finding. As soon as it finds something, it blocks it for every single phone in your in your organization, every single laptop in your organization. It has to be continually evolving because they're continually evolving and a lot faster than what we are. It's a business for them. We invest money in R&D and everything else, they're doing it as well. So in this case, if we'd applied that formula before, in our case, if you were using our products, the email security would have blocked the malware to start. But why just try and cover one spot? The next, the endpoint software would have blocked the ransomware there and it would stop the PDF from opening. Other products from that we call Umbrella plus firewalls would have actually blocked if it got past all those from calling out to the internet. It means nothing unless it can get back out to the internet and do something else there. So the answer is simple, a best of breed portfolio approach, architectural approach that's simple, open and automated. And is it real, is it happening? Um, are these things really being attacked? Well, here's a real world example. We recently looked after the Rio Olympic Games. We built all the networks, we built all the connectivity, the communications, and we put security in. They asked us to step the level of security up. So within two days, we installed the products and the solution architecture that I just found and looked after one of the biggest networks in the world that was running at the time, seven different networks. And we had multiple people say, so well, why? Who would want to attack the Olympic network? Well, look at this. We stopped 23,000 threats, attacks a day, a day during the Olympics. So what's Cisco? What's our commitment? Well, our commitment is that we will be continuing and always protecting ourselves. We're continuing to invest. We want to make sure that everything can be securely connected everywhere at any time. So as we work into this world, be it 20 billion devices or 50 billion devices, that security is at the forefront, that it's being thought about. We're investing billions, and as I said, we've invested $5 billion in the last three years alone to try and keep up. It's now our number one company focus. We've got at least 5,000 people dedicated just to this in R&D and investing and looking into where these, and we've made, created, and acquired a lot of products to get there. So in closing, we've, we've had a journey of what crimin, criminal activity looked like, what they were trying to steal, where they went to get it, and now the new Olgas of the world and what they're doing and what they're trying to steal. Now it's about thinking about what is what I call our duty of responsibility. What is our duty of responsibility to manage and look after and protect the data that we hold, that you hold, of your customers, their patient records, their financial data. Think about toys. Toys are now connected. There's been a recent case where someone hacked connected toys and dolls that were able to field and, and film, take pictures, and record the children's devices, someone was able to hack through those and get that information off there. That's our children's photos, our images out there. It's our duty of responsibility to do that. Did that toy manufacturer think about security first when they were developing their products, or was it an afterthought? And this is one of the things, as we're developing products, be it financial products, be it technology products, be it dolls, we need to think about security first in every single thing we do. It's a responsibility. Right now, those things connecting, the cameras, the light bulbs and that, they're not putting enough of that into it. Car companies are spending a lot of money right now investing in security first to make sure. You might have seen in the recent attack a couple of weeks ago that took down most of the internet at the core of the internet. I don't know if anybody read that or saw that. People couldn't get on websites. Life was shutting down in the US. My God, you can't get to the internet. That was criminals attacking surveillance cameras that are connected to the internet, and they used those as a vehicle to hit the internet. They didn't care about getting to those cameras. Those cameras weren't built with security. Those cameras had hard-coded passwords on them. You couldn't change them even if you want to. They found out the passwords, they got to those cameras, and then they used those as a vehicle to flood the network and took it down. So, we also have a duty of responsibility, not just for our customers, but for ourselves, for our own companies. Imagine the brand damage this does. 
And right now in New Zealand and Australia, there's no real regulation that requires us to communicate externally when one of these attacks happens. And guess what? Companies aren't. In the last four months alone, there's been multiple New Zealand companies that have been hit by multiple of these things, including ransomware, and they have paid. Have we seen it in the press? No, because we don't have to talk about it. Would it be embarrassing and damaging for our brand? Yes. In the US, you have to report it, and it is damaging brands. Imagine now the manufacturer of this camera, this IP surveillance camera, that has now been used to hit and take out the internet. What are they going to do, a product recall? What's that going to cost them? Car companies connecting now. So there's a lot to take in. It's not to scare, it's to make aware that it is there. It's a real industry. They're well funded. They are after our data. They are after what they're after looking at what value we perceive on that data. They don't know all the time. But they're testing and they're trying and they're always evolving. So the takeaway is ask, be aware, think about it. In fact, security everywhere and security inside the products you're developing, whatever you're developing, doing or launching, should be looked at as an innovative or a strategic initiative for you to get in front of your competitors. Do you have a more secure app banking application? Do you have a more secure terminal payment? People want to know that. People are starting to ask that. They don't trust anymore. They don't trust the devices that are connected. And neither should we. We need to check them. Someone asked me the other day, do you trust your front door? Because it's connected now. And it's one of the easiest things to hack to get to your network. Should your light bulb, the light bulb be able to buy a book off Amazon? Of course it shouldn't. You can't trust it. So it's about trust, it's about doing things. So I will leave you with that. Thank you for your time and I hope it's at least been thought provoking. Incredibly thought provoking. Thank you, Dave. Has anyone got some questions for Dave? Some, he's thrown up some big issues there, I think. Surely. No, okay, you're off the hook. Thank you, Dave.